All right, I think we should um, get underway with at least introducing ourselves. I wanted to say one, so sorry for the conference room um, dial-in trouble. Thank you all for coming in today, especially those of you who were planning on taking the day off or who thought you had a little vacation day with the legislature gone. Um, why don't we just, as a preliminary matter, go around and say who we are, and I want to know Plus for- one two zero two four four two two nine zero zero. He is now joining. Thanks for joining, and for those of you on the phone, in addition to people in the room, we also have a video camera because our local cable access station, which is called Orca, we um, invited them to come and tape this in case people who couldn't come um, wanted to observe and um, just you know be a part of the conversation after the fact, I guess, and, and know what, we, what was talked about. So um, Wayne from Orca is here. Thank you very much, and we will. Um, they're always published. All their uh, videos of meetings like this are published on Orca's website, so we can send the link once that's up. Um, so to begin matters, I am Charity Clark. I'm the chief of staff here at the Attorney General's office, and one of my tasks I oversee our legislative work. So that's why I'm here, and I will sort of serve as facilitator of this meeting, and why don't um, we start to my right with Ryan, and then we'll uh, have the folks on the phone introduce themselves. And if you could just say who you're representing, that, that's helpful. This is Ryan Krieger, Assistant Attorney General with the Public Protection Division here in Vermont. Uh, Jeff Kucher, the Executive Director of the Vermont Technology Alliance. Um, Claire Buckley from Leonine Public Affairs, and we have a number of clients that are interested in this. <laughs> Subject. Do you want me to? No, that's okay. okay. Hi, Zach Cominelli. I'm with the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, Be Burke. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Burke Jenkins. Um, I'm interning uh, in the AG's office, AG's uh, front office with communications and legislative matters. Hi, I'm Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. <clears throat> uh, Mark Hyman, also here with the Vermont Technology Alliance, uh, board member. Tammy Coda. Bruce Rice from MMR. Danielle Dean, CompTIA. All right, um, why don't we turn to the folks on the phone, and uh, apologies again for our conference call trouble, but if you could introduce yourselves um, for everyone, that would be great. Uh, John Holler with Sam Trek and Martin on behalf of Apple. Hi, this is Andrew Kingman, uh, Council of State Privacy and Security Coalition, and attorney at DLA Piper. Plus one two zero two seven one six two one seven two is now exiting. Oh, that was probably Amy. She had to leave early last. Uh, is anyone else on the phone besides John and Andrew? Say that again. Plus one six one seven <laughs> six nine four seven zero four three is now joining. All right, I left off with John and Andrew. We heard Technet. <laughs> we heard Technet. Yeah, we heard hey, Technet. And Ron Barnes with Google. Nick Jefferson. Tim, Wil Tim Wilkerson and, Chris and Kristen Grazioso from the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association. Hey, Tim. And Anna Myers from Amazon. Anyone else? All right, so why don't I um, just lay the table um, as to how we got here. And um, for those of you who weren't in the room last Thursday um, in House Commerce, uh, this hopefully will be helpful. So uh, there is, a, I was hoping Michael would be on the phone today, I did invite him, but there is an entrepreneur named Michael Lee who lives in Burlington who emailed Representative Marcotte, the chair of House Commerce, uh, the New York Times article about Clearview AI, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with um, that article or Clearview, um, saying, this is concerning, I would like the legislature to do something about facial recognition. And um, Representative Marcotte decided, and his committee decided, that they would um, take up uh, Representative Barbara Rachelson's bill, H595. They invited folks to testify about the bill Ryan and I were invited to go, we went. Um, just, and that was Thursday. Just before um, we, we went, we, we talked to TJ at the Attorney General, as you do, and say, you know, what do you think of the bill? And what the Attorney General wanted was a, you know, facial recognition being kind of one narrow subset of biometric data. We thought, well, this doesn't really cover 
what we're looking at, it's all uh, biometric data, and you know, there's three states who have bills on biometric data, and so um, what he wanted was a bill that would cover biometric data and follow um, in the paths of one of these states, and his recommendation was Illinois. Um, and so we testified, Ryan and I, in House Commerce, and <clears throat> we um, included in our testimony, in our written testimony, um, the Illinois statute. So um, that's kind of uh, you know how we got to that point. And then upon hearing the testimony of uh, Ryan and me, and also Mr. Lee from Burlington, the chair invited um, or kind of requested, I guess, that we try to all get together on um, the stakeholders um, and have a conversation about the bill and then come back next week. Um, we are scheduled to testify at 1. I don't know if others have been invited to testify on Tuesday when they get back, um, but Ryan and I will be there at 1. So that's kind of the next event um, after this. Um, I should also make Plus a note. one eight zero two seven nine three three one seven six is now exiting. Um, so the legislative timeline um, for those on the phone who might not be familiar. Plus one eight zero two two seven nine four two six two is now joining. Hi, welcome to the meeting. Can you announce yourself? Hi, it's Maggie Lenz from Lee. Plus Lenz. one eight zero two seven nine three three one seven six. Hi there. Still on hold. Is now joining. Is someone else new on the call? I'm sorry, Charity. It's John Hollow. I got dropped. I'm on a train, so if I get dropped again, I'll just stay off. Oh, no, no, John, call back in. No problem. <laughs> um, oh, next. The, uh, I know it's a little disruptive, it sounds like. It's <laughs> because our, our super fancy um, conference call <laughs> number um, lists yeah, the entire yeah. phone number when they call, so we get your, your full uh, phone number. <laughs> Um, so oh, I was yeah, just, I was just, money. Yeah, so yeah, there you go. I was just <laughs> noting our, um, our timeline for those who aren't in the state house all the time like we are. So uh, we have the, um, the crossover date where bills need to cross over from one house to the other is next week. And so um, there is some, um, you know, uh, a different timeline, I guess, than what would ordinarily we would look at, such as the, our privacy bill um, that we all worked on last session, S110. Uh, so in this situation, plus one seven three four eight one two three one seven six is now joining. Hello, welcome to the meeting. Can you say who you are? Yes, I'm so sorry about that. This is Amy Keller. Oh, no worries, uh, From the law firm of Duchella Levitt. Welcome. Okay. Just, Hi, how are you? Thank you. We're just um, filling in everyone on the timeline. And so a lot, if this, you know, our recommendation last Thursday was to, look, you know, use the Illinois law that um, businesses are already complying with. And if changes need to be made to that um, based on these conversations, it might make the best sense to do that work in the Senate um, once the bill crosses over for crossover. So that's kind of where our starting place was when we when we testified um, last week. And Ryan, have I forgotten anything before we get into a kind of roundtable of those are the key, key okay points, yeah. key points. All right, so I think what we should do, you know, we've we testified, we've sort of said what we had to say, and it would be really wonderful to hear from um, from all of you. So. I guess I'll just open up the, the room for anyone who wants to comment or ask questions. I, I was going to start, honestly, I, I, I haven't had time to look at everything in depth and do research just because of stuff that I already had. My biggest concern is I emailed as soon as I could. Plus you know, one eight zero two seven nine three three one seven six. Mark is Adam now Lee, exiting. Board member of the Vermont Technology Alliance. Plus one two zero two four four two two nine zero zero is now exiting. I'm. I had anticipated sending out an update to our members, sort of either by Friday afternoon <clears throat> or Monday or Tuesday this week. Anyway, it's break. Here's what's going on and whatnot. I haven't even sent that update out yet. Because now I want to, I've 
want to include this and that delayed by another five days, our ability to literally do any due diligence on our own and then reach out to our membership, which are individuals and businesses throughout Vermont, to get feedback from them. So honestly, as a board member of the Vermont Technology Alliance, I'm feeling extremely constrained in not being able to understand even before you're saying the plan is in fact to go back in on testify and testify on Tuesday at one and by Friday this will be at a committee without any opportunity to do anything. Go, the plan is to pass the House, rush it through the House, and we'll deal with the objections in the Senate. I, I, I don't like that process and it makes our ability to engage their membership, get feedback, figure it out, really difficult, which is difficult anyway because we represent technology businesses and the kind of definitions, words, semantics, and everything else that are included in a vastly complex, more complex proposal than a, there should be some transparency here, which, I, which we also agree with. We supported that and we're actually planning on that's fine next time. It's a part of H95 and going to point out some other issues we think are worthy of further study given their view of AI and whatnot. I've chatted with Michael. We, you know, we, we, we knew all this and then what came out of that was, have you read the Illinois law yet? And crossovers next week. Excuse me, could you speak up? Yeah, and crossovers next please. week. So Thank you. I'm just, I'm struggling with the fact that we are not going to be able to get feedback from a number of our members, all of them have different perspectives, different takes, and different maybe uses of technology and whatnot. Uh, so we're not going to be able to do much by Friday. And that's concerning just from a process point of view. We're, we're stuck having to represent the membership. And all I can do right now is say the speed is concerning because of the complexity involved. And we recognize all the issues, you know, and really just want to make sure we don't rush too fast. There's words matter. And on this stuff, it's just so complex. I Can just, you, I would please state your name before you speak to. I, you know, I, I would want to, this is Danielle Dean with uh, CompTIA. I would also echo concerns with timing on this, especially since Illinois isn't a done deal. They still have, I think, upwards of six or seven amendments that they're considering this year to change different aspects. Yeah, and um, uh, different aspects of, of their law on the books now. So, I mean, companies may even, you know, it's by the end of this year, have to comply with a different set of rules. Um, and so even, you know, with the, with the idea that, you know, we're going to just push this off to the Senate, let them deal with it there, there's already, you know, laws on the books, it's, it's still a moving target for our companies. And yeah, that timing is will be, though. That's Yes, the legislators want to amend their bill, amend their law. So I, I think that's just the way it works. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the sense of like, if we're, if we want to have a meaningful conversation about, you know, vetting all of the issues, maybe taking some lessons learned from what Illinois is dealing with now in Texas and, uh, was it Oregon, Washington? Washington <laughs> thank you, um, that have already passed this bill. I mean, I think that there's, there's time for us to have a meaningful conversation with with companies and you know pushing this through so quickly won't really allow us to vet and have these types of meaningful conversations with both your office and with the legislature mm -hmm. and this is Tammy and Char Charity, Charity this is and, and Ryan this is Andy Kingman here um, first of all thanks for you know letting us um, setting aside some time today for us to, to chat um, you know I think um, you know, we're just a few days removed from S-110 being put on the governor's desk, and that was, you know, a meaningful privacy bill that was the result of, you know, a, a multi-stakeholder input that a lot of us had time to work on together and, you know, ended up with something that because we put the time in up front was able to, you know, pass with, you know, relatively smooth, um, a relatively smooth process. I think even though, you know, that, that was based on, you know, a bill that had been adopted in, you know, 25 states or so. And even that took a little bit of time for it to move through. Um, I think, you know, we would, you know, offer that, 
um, that type of process would be a, a great process to, to go through for this issue um, rather than, you know, take the, the bill that is probably one of the most controversial um, privacy statutes in the country um, as a base and put it through in, in a week and a half uh, in, in a chamber. I mean, uh, you know, I think would be more than willing to engage in a, you know, thoughtful stakeholder process and um, work with, you know, different constituents. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, would, would love to hear your thoughts on your willingness to do that. So um, this is Ryan Krieger from the AG's office. Uh, I think we've heard that concern about the process loud and clear. Uh, this is something which we will have to discuss and, and talk to TJ and, and mention that this has been raised. That said, we've been asked a request from the legislature to advise them, uh, which is why we're here. So taking that into account that there are concerns about the process and I'm sure that those concerns would also be expressed to the legislature and you know so that may be one track that this takes noted if it does not take that track and they do want a solution this year um, and we have limited time to talk can we turn the discussion to the solution itself and hear any concerns about that in particular we we can talk about the solution, but but BIPA as a solution is is not a is, is you know effectively a non-starter for you know most of the folks on this call. Um, it is incredibly difficult to inform, to comply with, and it has um, you know instigated any number of frivolous class action lawsuits. Um, I am defending one uh, client right now um, in one of those and. Um, you know, there are other um, states to choose from, but this is a statute that was passed a year after the iPhone was invented and, you know, fails in any number of ways to, um, you know, consider what the modern online ecosystem is. And I would, you know, just urge that the legislature uh, take some time on this. It's an, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated issue, and what biometrics consist of um, is incredibly complicated. It is getting more complicated. Um, it, it just this, this statute is incredibly hard to comply with. I counsel you know, numerous clients through it, and it, it's very, very challenging. Uh, and that's despite the fact that it's been on the books for 10 years. It's so I've heard, a lot of compliance. So this is Charity, so I've heard um, hard to comply with Concerns about enforcement creating a lot of class actions and concerns about the definition of biometric data. Are those the three kind of big concerns that you would flag? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think making Vermont a, a haven for class action attorneys would be a, a concern to flag. It's, like it really is if you google you know bipa right now you will see that they are are just feasting on this law and and with very little you know substantive law coming out of it just in in terms of there's a lot of stuff that's being again this is mark hyman of vermont technology alliance i've also had been um, on the board we work very well i think uh with the ag's office on uh, not just on uh a number of different privacy stuff. I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to the data broker a couple of years ago and everything where that was, there was a real need and, and we had to really figure it out. That was happened to me as I was in my previous life, also going through GDPR compliance and, you know, and, and everything. And I, uh, to the extent, I, there are absolutely legitimate concerns in terms of privacy and protections that apply to us all. Um, there is a growing, you know, if we're thinking that we're protecting folks from the big bad evil companies out there. I will just remind you, my sole focus, you know, in this capacity is on Vermont's individual and tech businesses and communities and whatnot. And we are Vermont businesses of all sizes um, that could be, definitely will be impacted by this um, this bill, and not necessarily based on their tech or their business, just because there's a. a an easy target and a mechanism to to do so to go after them. I'm actually concerned more about the Vermont 
small business tech community. It's every year. It's we're just about to get there, and it's really hard. And we're trying. We're trying to be very responsible. Local Vermont businesses. Um, this just every year there's something, and this is just another one. Last year I was testifying on S18, and it was the the unintended consequences was the primary concern. As we also acknowledge the legit substantive issues, and let's figure out it's very complex. Uh, so I know you said that you haven't had a, a lot of time to digest the um, the Illinois law, um, but I'm trying to you know, just identify the concerns that you do have that are specific. It sounds like you you're concerned with the enforcement portion as well. I'm concerned with enforcement. I'm concerned with uh, slight nuances in in semantics. Give in a bill that was passed in 2008 with today's technology and sort of saying, I heard in a different, very different context, no, it's software as a service we're going after, not platform or infrastructure as a service. And I sit here and say, which the marketing folks came up with four years ago, mm -hmm. and which now everybody also knows. So outdated the, definitions. It's, it's and, outdated okay. definitions and whatnot, and the complexity and the difficulty is, Charity, I will tell you that you know I worked with a client uh, a couple weeks ago, and they're a startup, um, and trying to look at where to deploy their products. And we advised them to literally just not enter the Illinois market because the enforcement risk uh, and the compliance difficulty was so burdensome and costly uh, that we just said you probably shouldn't go into uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just I don't think that that's the message that Vermont wants to send to, like we're not just talking about you know large businesses, it's just not the message you wanna to send to small businesses or businesses that are looking at bringing products and, and you know jobs to Vermont. Yeah, that's a, it's a great real live example of what Mark was just um, saying. May I, ask, may I ask a question, Jeff Kucher, Vermont Technology Alliance, is your current proposal to take this bill and have the House Commerce Committee pass it? I mean, I think what our proposal is now is we like the Illinois law and think that should be a model and we want to have a conversation with everyone, all the stakeholders, and find out where the concerns are, where, you know. No, I'm, I'm just going back to your trying to get something over the crossover date. Sure. I mean, if we want to and, pass. And, and my, in my informal, our informal conversation with, with uh, Chair Marcotte was that this would be something we would look at over the summer. So there's a difference of perspective from what I thought, what I heard you say and what I heard him say. Uh, what I, I heard him well. And I wasn't I, in the hearing you, with you. Right. You I, was, I was not oh, there. Oh, okay. So. so I don't know. He, he this probably, seems to be moving quickly. That's why I don't I think he would have asked us to meet over the break if he wasn't planning on doing something next week. I, um, this is Maggie Lenz. I just want to say that I spoke with Marcotte yesterday, and he also, I can second that, he told me that he was looking to get something worked on over the summer. That was absolutely what he said. Yeah, Maybe he weird. just wanted us to come in on our vacations. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I had some emails and, uh, as well, just reading it, it's sort of the, I actually was coming, I'm not sure if you were saying we should adopt this now or we should look at H-595 and set up, we'd like, you know, if the, I actually didn't know what the real proposal was, is the proposal, I have no problem with, we'd like to use this as the model. If the next part of the sentence is, and study it and have a thoughtful conversation about it, let's do that. Let's hammer out what the thoughtful conversation should be. We can support, I, I mean, we'll talk to membership, we can always support a thoughtful look at anything. I'm, we are happy to support you know, we were in support of H-595 as introduced, we wanted to look at other issues actually for further study related to just facial recognition. I would say I would ask that the collective proposal after we synced up, uh, my understanding was the chair and the committee were looking for this group sync up and come back Can you to us speak with up, recommendations. Please, for those of us on the phone? With recommendations, not necessarily with the language to pass by Friday. And so my I came here saying, hoping this group would recommend we go back in in lockstep. We will be there in some capacity on, on Tuesday as well, whether it's Jeff or, or myself along with uh, or, or the other. Um, 
I'd love to go back and have everybody say, we support X and we'd like to do a deep dive further study on the following and we'll further refine that. Let's pass this in the Senate. We get something in in terms of getting some notice out on H-595. I, I, it's not a massive bill, but I think there's always benefit to transparency and notice. I just believe that. Um, and then we are all in lockstep when we pass saying the Attorney General's office is going to study this with local and, you know, and other stakeholders that will be impacted by it. And I, I, I think that the complexity of these issues require that length of discussion, given the timing. And yeah, I, I mean, Chair and Ryan, I mean, I, yeah. I think you guys know that we're not, you know, SPSC is not fire breathers and we, we're, you know, generally willing to work on, on legislation and, and try to work with you guys. And, you know, to the extent that we can have a study process and like we did with the student privacy bill, you know, exchange drafts and, and work with lots of different constituents and stakeholders, then I think that, um, you know, we're, we're very willing to do that. And I don't, I'm not gonna speak for everybody, you know, on the phone and in the room, but I think everybody, you know, most, most folks are, are pretty willing to engage in that and you'll find, you know, willing partners who want to address the issues and, you know, sincerely work on something. I think if the, you know, if the course of action is we're going to, you know, get BIPA into the Senate by next week um, and then try to fix it in the, in the following five weeks, I mean, we, again, just to use the student privacy bill as the example of the data breach bill, we, we spent, you know, months on that, and, and that bill has been adopted in 25 states. But this bill, as you guys know, has not been adopted in a single other state. Um, and so, you know, I think to call it a model is, is maybe a little bit overstating it. And, you know, I, my concern is that if, if this is the course of action that we go down, you know, everybody in the room who is, you know, right now a willing partner is going to be a, you know, vigorous uh, opponent of, of that course of action. Sure. Uh, so Zach Tominelli with VPIRG. Um, so I'm not representing any technology companies. Um, so uh, speaking on behalf of sort of our membership, 50,000 Vermonters, um, we support this bill, BIPA. Uh, we support moving fast on it. That being said, obviously that is not shared by the vast majority of people in this room. We would be happy to engage in a, a process. We engage in the data broker process and the student privacy process. That being said, um, you know, I, some of the things that I'm hearing, uh, you know, in the room at the moment are things like FIPA is a non-starter and this is always going to be constantly moving or changing and it's hard to get the definition. So while I'm happy to participate in a process, I am concerned that that process would not actually result in vigorous agreement by the stakeholders here because at the end of the day, uh, what is contained in this bill, and it's been on the books since 2008, it has been subject to several lawsuits, it's not going to be, you know, anything substantial like this is not going to be, I think, probably well received by, by industry. That being said, um, you know, I, there's a lot of people around this table, so, you know, I, if people are going to oppose this vigorously, that's, that's all well and good, but I see, you know, no problem with moving forward with the law that's been on the books since 2008 in another state. Um, so this is Falco Schilling from the ACLU of Vermont, and we're in a very similar position. Um, the ACLU of Illinois helped support and work on the original BIPA. They were an amicus in the most recent lawsuit. So this is a law that we are supportive of and we're supportive of moving forward with. Um, understand concerns around timeline, but also this is something where the legislature has asked uh, for people to come in and talk about this because there's grave concerns. For those of you in the room on Friday, as people learned about the implications and where the technology is going, there was rightfully a lot of concern about what this means for personal information, personal privacy, um, and, and the testimony they heard is there is no time to wait. And so kicking the can down the road is something that is a concern as the technology evolves, as we see more breaches, and as more data is collected without consumers being enforced. So we are, we are supportive of moving forward with this legislation, understand the objections, and would be willing to continue that discussion. Um, I would also just say that if there is some sort of formal study process of this over the summer, that is something that if the legislature was going to put that forward, that would need to move out of committee by the end of next week. 
Um, so just saying, if you want to have legislative counsel to support this um, with their research capacity in any way, or if you're trying to bring in outside stakeholders who can be compensated um, for their time in this conversation, those are things that the legislature would, would be discussing and probably moving forward in some form next week. So the, the conversation dies if, in many ways, if it is not moved forward in some way, be it the original piece of legislation as introduced or uh, containing BIPA. So that's, that's our perspective. At this point in time, uh, Mark Hyman, Vermont Technology Alliance. Again, to the extent that we are referred to as industry, no, Zach, not, no, no personal offense taken and whatnot. But I, I we always remind folks in any meeting, you know, I am now a one-person bootstrap startup. After my other thing, I've been in the tech sector for a long time. I just came from a dairy farm this morning also a member of the tech sector. Tech is ubiquitous. When we talk about at least the Vermont Technology Alliance members, I'm talking about 50,000 Vermonters too. I was just in Springfield at the Black River Innovation Campus talking to them about public policy initiatives, saying I've got this meeting, I'm not really sure what it's about. Do you, any of your folks care about anything tangentially related to this? Might that impact your business plans or anything like that? Trying to revitalize Springfield in a dilapidated school building that we're all spending our time trying to restore, not Kennedy County, but other parts of the state as well. Um, and the answer I got was, yeah, I don't know in what way, but I can think of 20 people off the top of my head who are trying to hire people, recruit, start businesses, find work that will be impacted one way or the other, both on, we're all worried about the all consumers, but also, what are they trying to do? And when I said, well, there was testimony Thursday, and now crossover's Friday, so everybody's rushing this through. That I just said rush, I don't, we weren't talking about any substance. That sets people who are literally trying to start something one person at a time, makes everybody freak out. Not to mention, if there's a headline, there are four startups that don't come to Vermont that we will never know about because they scratch their head thinking on 93 and kept on driving, is, is my well, sarcastic. If Jeff Kutcher, Vermont Technology Alliance, I think we could start from that as an organization. We want businesses to be able to use the technology appropriately for services that consumers want but also making sure they're informed and we protect their personal identity and their confidential information. So we're not saying let's go one, one side and let's use it all in any way if business wants to. Let's make sure we have the protections, but let's not, because where we sit, let's not scare away or do damage to the businesses that are either working in that area here in Vermont and serving Vermonters and the startups and medium-sized businesses that we represent who may be using this technology as part of their offering. And sometimes what we see, because tech kind of seems to be new sometimes to some Vermonters, is the not recognizing the unintended consequences that can affect businesses. Even Michael Lee, who is a member of ours, uh, who we talked to, who spoke, and we started talking about, well, what about this, Michael? What about that? He's like, eh, well, no, I just didn't like some guy who, who's able to go off and do something and not get anyone's permission. So I think, and we're kind of like, yeah, we agree with that. Yeah, but we, within that range. Isn't that BIPA? They, you have to get people's permission? <laughs> well, yeah, but even how you define, but I mean, I haven't read all this. So I've read what you sent out. I mean, the definition of what biometric information is. I'm trying to think, you know, so if I use an app that tags people, I take your photo mm -hmm. and it tags you. I've used it. Maybe we're friends. I say, that's my friend then I've probably broken this law. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. But yeah, I don't know if tagging your friend on Facebook violates this law. This is, sorry, go ahead. Uh, what did somebody just say? Go ahead. I, I was going to say, this is Amy Keller. I'm, I'm actually an attorney in Illinois, um, in Chicago, and I have brought specific cases. Um, I actually filed an amicus in support of the Rosenbach case. Tagging your friend on Facebook, is, it would not be a violation of HIPAA. <laughs> Using algorithms to predictive code someone's face um, and say, based upon the distance between their eyes, I can machine code basically and tag this person in a number of photos without that person's consent. So I, I want to just 
clear up a couple of misconceptions about Illinois BIPA. I, I heard earlier that, um, you know, class action attorneys like me are now feasting on BIPA and are filing a number of frivolous lawsuits. And I, I think we just need to remember that the whole point of BIPA is that you have immutable human characteristics that cannot be changed. And in order to use those, a business basically needs to get someone's permission to use those. Because God forbid there's a data breach in the future that exposes this kind of information. That's it. That's the backstop. You cannot change that information. So requiring companies to get consent, have basic security protocols, and that kind of thing, I think we can all, all agree that that seems reasonable. The reason why you're seeing such a I think you're right, Amy, and I think now, that's why we're happy that the, that we updated the uh, data breach statute last year to include biometrics. And, and so I was continuing, I think the reason why everyone is seeing an uptick in litigation now um, is because there, there was just a big payday um, in the Facebook uh, BIPA case. And as a result of that, you're seeing some people who had otherwise not filed cases before, now they're filing cases. Um, but I, I think we need to remember that for a very long time, people were not filing BIPA cases. This is actually a law that some businesses did not know about. And I know a lot of businesses now are a little flat-footed because they were violating the law and they just didn't know about it before. Um, so, you know, I, I think if businesses were well informed about the law so that they could take steps to protect themselves going forward, if they can't afford uh, to use biometric information, then maybe they shouldn't be using it uh, if they cannot afford to protect it or obtain proper consent to use it. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, I, I think we just need to keep in mind the, um, the backstops available to companies who think that lawsuits are frivolous. Of course you have Rule 11 motions that you can file if, if in fact companies do think that lawsuits are frivolous. So I, I don't want to, um, you know, have everyone be sounding the alarms that God forbid Vermont, you know, be proactive in ensuring that um, biometric information, which again cannot be changed, should be protected and should you should obtain consent before using it. Uh, just had to say that. Thanks, Amy. Has, is anyone else, just while, while we have uh, someone on the phone, um, anyone else on the phone uh, who hasn't spoken yet I want to weigh in on any of this? Tim, Anna, Maggie, Bueller? No? Okay, Ryan? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm listening to everything that everyone's saying. We're, we're taking notes. We're, we're definitely going to have a long conversation uh, when this is done. Um, I, I just want to, you know, address one notion is, I don't mean to be flip here, but it, it is kind of interesting hearing, you know, the tech industry writ large, and I mean kind of like the more national tech industry saying, we're really afraid of going fast. Like, this is going too fast. I mean, you know, one, one of the companies on the phone literally had the motto for a long time, uh, what was it, move fast and break things. Um, we don't want to break anything, okay? But there is a sense of urgency in the legislature. There is a sense of urgency in the citizenry. We hear about this all of the time because the tech industry and tech generally is always going to outstrip legislative response. Okay, The tech industry is going to look different six months from now than it looks now. It's going to look different a year from now. Um, and that is why you know, anyone who has seen our efforts in the tech uh, regulatory process is we really do try to think about legislation that is generally tech neutral. We don't try to code specific technological solutions into laws. Uh, we have background in uh, the technology industry. Uh, we reach out to experts to try to make sure uh, these things. We try to legislate in terms of broader principles rather than very specific prescriptive requirements. Interestingly, it's often industry representatives who come in and demand more prescriptive requirements because they say the language has to be really, really, really specific, and that's a whole different uh, philosophical discussion. But as, as we hear it so far, 
the legislature uh, and, and our office feel a sense of urgency about this issue because biometric use and data use generally has been an issue for years and years and years. I mean, at least 12 years, this, this is not a new concept. And we have determined to commit the resources that if the legislature chooses that it wants to move forward on an accelerated plan, which is not our preference as an office, as you know from the past, we generally prefer to take a more measured approach. But if the urgency is there, uh, we, have, uh, we are committing the resources to try to meet that pace, which means hearing from people, talking about language. Anyone who has worked with us on legislation in the past knows that we can be pretty nimble you know, I mean, we, I mean, heck, S110, the data broker bill, we, we were, there were, what, 13 versions of the data broker bill? We were changing a, a version every day. We were having multiple conversations. There was always going to be urgency and, and things happening. I don't want to downplay the, the, the worries about speed, but there are a number of people on the phone right now who have a lot of experience with the BIPA law on both sides of it, who have, you know, who represent, you know, various interests. I have been getting up to speed on the BIPA law. Um, I'm actually supposed to be on vacation all next week. I will not be. I will be working on this law because we think that the, we think the urgency is, is important. Um, so that's one point I, I want to make, you know, assuming that the legislature does decide to go forward on this course. And you know, we don't know what they're going to decide next week. But we need to be ready for whatever the course they decide to take. And then the second thing I want to note is that, um, you know, we have been looking at the Illinois BIPA law. We have been looking at the Washington State BIPA law. We have been looking at the Texas BIPA law. Uh, we have been speaking to uh, experts and people with, with knowledge, and we hope to keep doing that. Uh, the, the legislature is going to expect some language from us next week, assuming they don't change their mind. Um, and what we propose is not necessarily like the, the current language of the BIPA law, all or nothing. It's either going to be that, pass it next week and worry about it on the Senate. There is actually time. I know it's, what day is it, Thursday? I know it's, it, no, it's, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> it's Wednesday, thank you. Um, so there is actually time uh, to have some conversations and to discuss what language might even be put before the legislature um, then. And, and again, I mean, from a lawyer standpoint, three days is forever to talk about this stuff as far as I'm concerned. We can have lots of conversations and really get into a lot of the weeds on this stuff in that amount of time. And you know, we have the, we have the uh, bandwidth to do so. So, so but we, Chris. Just real quick, just one thing to that. And, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think, me? sorry, Chris Rice from MMR. Um, I, I think the, the work that you guys led on with Data Broker uh, the same uh, the stakeholder engagement process you guys had on uh, the privacy bill that was just signed into law. I, I think those are models for how you arrive at a good policy product. Um, the, the, the point that you're leaving out and the big part that you're leaving out is you have all the time in the world. Some of us may all have all the time in the world over the next several days. What's not clear to me is how much time the uh, Commerce Committee is going to have to spend on this. And since they're the ones that are the decision makers, it's, it's, you're a subject matter expert. There are many other subject matter experts on this issue. There aren't in the Commerce Committee. And them getting up to speed and understanding this at the same level that all the rest of us do to make some of these top policy calls I think is a tall ask. And I, I understand exactly what you're saying about the urgency. I just, I think it's it's a tough thing to do, to do with crossover hanging over everybody's head. It's a, it's a tall ask of the committee, and it's a tall ask to the people in the room, um, and yourselves, and on the phone to do that in that short order. Um, so I won't repeat everything everybody else has already said. I think the best work that you guys have done in privacy area and the best work that all the stakeholders have done is a thoughtful, uh, collaborative approach. Not everybody's always going to be happy, but we do our best work when we do it together and we take the time to do it. And I think right now, we don't have the luxury of either one of those things. 
Paul also just say, if it were me personally, I have the time, I've been doing enough privacy stuff and whatnot, but I'm here representing my membership. And I'll say it unless Jeff shakes me off and says we've got more resources than I think the two of us can handle. Because you're looking at the two resources right now and stuff like this. Uh, the Vermont Technology Alliance does not have the resources to diligently study this in a few days and explain it all to statewide membership. I've just done 600 miles in the past three days to talk to like six of them to come back and give us feedback so that we can be a part of this process. We, we can't be a part of this process in a deliberative, conscious way from a fiduciary obligation point of view, although I have concerns. I talked about them with Michael Lee. I've read the articles. I, I share, actually, everybody's thing. To the extent that we typically say Vermont's a little bit different than everybody else out there, I, I think the same, I'll say the same for our membership as compared to maybe the perception of big tech outside of Vermont. But I'm here fighting for my Vermont, for my Vermont membership. And I'm just telling you from a process point of view, we don't have resources to get there by Friday in any way that makes sense. And so as a, from my point of view, not Jeff's as staff, but from a fiduciary board level point of view, I have to go back here and say, well, if there's no time to go back to the membership, explain everything, get feedback, come back and speak thoughtfully and constructively with both, with, but really, we appreciate that. I'll echo everything everybody said about how the Attorney General's office has really approached these big issues for such a small state. With 50 other you know, issues going on, we also don't have time for it. Um, I'm going to look at Jeff right after this outside of here and say something to the effect of, do I wring my hands or do we just get the update of saying, call and say no? I'd rather, like, I hope the Attorney General's recommendation, and I think that's what the committee is, what's the best way for the Commerce Committee to move forward? I hope our collective agreed upon recommendation is to take every issue as seriously I don't think outlining a thoughtful list of stuff, of very complex issues that need months of discussion, that might need a lot of discussion amongst a lot of different stakeholders. I don't think that's being delaying. I don't think that's not taking it seriously. I'm ringing the alarm bell saying we need to define the study and do it as soon as possible. So I'm hearing that. Ryan, yeah. that's it. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, if you guys are looking for language, we will draft, uh, you know, a very robust study committee uh, that, you know, there, there are ways, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it, uh, that you guys can provide to the com to the uh, Commerce Committee. Um, I, I just, you know, this is not a fixable bill in, in five weeks. And, I mean, to my knowledge, it's not actually a bill right now, right? It hasn't actually been introduced yet. Well, I mean, what, what we have now is 595. It would be an amendment to 595. Right. Right. So there's, the actual bill hasn't even been introduced yet, right? No, it would just be a straight so, ball. It's five, the bill is right. 595. So, it just wouldn't look like that. Right. So, so my point, uh, you know, I, I guess I have three points. One is that we are happy to draft up uh, a draft of a study committee uh, that we can get to you, you know, in the next couple days here before Friday. Um, two, you know, the points about Clearview that were brought up, those are not, uh, you know, in, in the urgency around that particular situation. That is not necessarily just what BIPA gets at. BIPA gets at, you know, virtually any business that has any degree of fraud authentication. Um, and that leads it to my third point, which is it is not possible to fix this bill in five weeks because my point earlier about it ignoring the online ecosystem, more specifically, it doesn't take into account the fact that there are service providers who use biometric information. It doesn't take into account the fact that there is literally no fraud protection um, in this bill. Um, there are any number of reasons why this bill is not workable, and you have people around the table saying, we are willing to work on the issue, we understand the urgency, you know, we are willing to go through a robust process. I would just urge you to work with us on this um, and not try to push this through um, just because 
you know, you're, you're hearing something from the legislature. Thanks, Andy. Um, Jeff Kucher again, Vermont Technology Alliance. I just wanted to ask a question based on what you said, Ryan. Is your office actually hearing from people before this came up about biometric concerns? We are, well, we're, he we're definitely hearing about privacy concerns generally. Uh, we have definitely heard about facial recognition concerns, absolutely. Um, as I testified in the, uh, in the legislature uh, last week, facial recognition is, is a subset of biometrics. Um, and we do not think a piecemeal approach, and that, which has been basically the entire way that we've dealt with privacy law up until now. It's been a very reactive, let's pick off this area, this area, this area. And that, you know, it's, it's, it's not sufficient to protect consumers. So your office believes there should be a bill like this uh, or a version of BIPA? I mean, that's what we recommended last week. Right, I mean, you, would you have brought this on your own if there wasn't a hearing or discussion about it? I'm just trying to understand where we, you came. We didn't this year. I mean, we, we could have. We were asked to testify on right. it, and that's, that was our And we testimony. got asked to testify after Michael raised an alarm about Clearview. I was trying to confuse how we got here so fast, but. Yeah, I, I and, and then the let me go. And, and you've looked at of the other proposed legislation. Do you think what's now the Illinois legislation, do you think that's the the best one or the one we should adopt? I mean, right now when you're looking at it, when you talk to the legisl legislature? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we're, I don't think anyone thinks that Illinois has, the Illinois BIPA is like the be all end all of BIPAs. And it certainly, um, you know, could use some, a Vermont touch, shall we say. Um, but when we looked at the three choices, it seemed to us the best foundation to begin with. Then right. you talked about any law can be improved. Would you would yeah. you change it? Would you put this Vermont touch? I'm just trying to follow you. So we could do this quickly. Uh, I just wonder what you wanted to see happen quickly. If we just said go ahead, do whatever you want, what would be your your approach? I'm just trying to understand where you, where your guys are coming at it from. I mean, Obviously, I think that we're saying slow down, but I'm trying to understand what you were. Sure. We, we would need to have that conversation internally before we say what we would recommend doing. Okay. I mean, what, where we are is we were asked by the chair of the House Commerce Committee to get together with stakeholders and talk about it. That's what we're doing right now. So that, okay. I mean, I kind of answered that question before, and that's, that's really where, you know, we were asked to, to testify in the bill. That, that was our testimony. We think we should have a Vermont BIPA, and then here we are with the next step, which is we were requested by the chair to okay. have this conversation. So first of all, I should reiterate, thank you so much for being well, a part of the conversation. Thank you for and, having, thank you and, for inviting us. And helping yeah. us to, uh, <laughs> to respond to the chair's request. So um, thank you for, for, being, um, for being here to have this conversation. And certainly we're hearing what you say and um, our fearless interns taking notes so that we can be for sure you. to digest everything. Um, and it's really helpful to have just begin the conversation. I'm hearing themes. I'm hearing this is not enough time. I'm hearing concerns about um, the enforcement provision in the specific Illinois BIPA. I'm hearing concerns about the definition of biometric data. We already have a definition of biometric data in Vermont law. So I mean, right away I can say that's where we would begin. Um, and there was one, what am I missing? Enforcement, definition, and? Uh, there was talking about platforms. I, I heard that. Uh, well, uh, particular types of, I mean, I mean the meat of the compliance provisions are yes. incredibly difficult to comply with. They are ambiguous. They don't sync up with, you know, the way that businesses generally um, provide privacy policies. Again, there's no fraud. There's no recognition of online service providers. There's no recognition of cloud storage providers. There's no recognition of security provisions. Andy, can or, I ask you, you a know, question? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In your opinion, do you think some of these flaws are um, due to the age of the initial bill, like technology has changed and the bill just wasn't written in a way to be flexible to move with technology, or do you think it's there's some other cause? Um, no, I mean, I think a lot of it was the fact, again, I mean, it was literally written the year after the iPhone came out, so the way that the online ecosystem has evolved is just not reflective of, of the way that this bill, uh, the way that you're required to comply with this bill. Okay. Um, and, you know, I just, I don't think that the issues in and of themselves are wrong. Like the idea of trying to, you know, provide consumers more control over their privacy. I mean, I think, you know, everybody on, 
that's in the room here is on board with that, but this bill in particular, it's not a like, oh, well, we'll just tweak a few provisions and, you know, as you sort of said, like put a Vermont touch on it. It's just like, it's very important to have a conversation to understand, uh, you know, um, Pam Dixon, who I, I think you guys have talked to, you know, is not, um, is, is certainly, you know, not on, you know, quote, our side and has the same reaction. And, you know, a lot of the work that they've done is um, around just how complex the issue of biometrics is. And this is just a very, you know, sort of hatchet, meat cleaver approach to a very technical and complex issue. Let, let, let me ask, let me ask something. Let me try to like go from, from try, try a little bit more of a constructive approach here. Um, broad, broad swaths here. Assuming that there was a definition of biometrics that was agreeable to people, okay? And, and we have actually had the argument over biometrics in the last two laws, and we've used the same definition each time. So, so let's say, for example, that maybe that was a good one to start with, the definition that's already in our law. And then looking at, say, the Illinois, I see that there's a ton of carve-outs from definite. This is not, you know, organ donations are not biometrics. Okay, fair enough. So let's say we took that and then all these carve-outs. Just let's say we had something everyone agreed to. Okay. So. One section of the law says, basically, if you have biometric identifiers that are electronic, you need to protect them. You need good data security, right? Um, that seems like a reasonable position, right? Is, is there anyone who objects to the notion of requiring reasonable data security for companies that collect biometrics? Well, you've already got that in the data breach law, right? Well, not exactly, because in the... In yes, the you, you, yeah. you have reasonable security controls in your data breach law, and bio, we just added biometrics we, last year. We, we have reasonable uh, <laughs> security controls for data brokers. There is no reasonable data security for, for anyone who collects that kind of data. So that's not in the law. Um, if it's a data broker that's collecting by... Actually, right now what it says, uh, 9 VSA 24... 47, 37, says that if a data broker, a data broker must have reasonable data security and it explains exactly what that means. It's based on the Massachusetts regulation, which we assumed everyone was compliant with already, must have that level of data uh, security for PII, which currently, until the signature happened, is social security number, et cetera, et cetera. Biometrics is now part of that. So yes, so now uh, data brokers have to have reasonable data security for their biometric data. Great. And so, does anyone object to the notion that anyone collecting biometric information should have reasonable data security? I mean, the idea here is, right, if you're collecting a thumbprint to authenticate someone, or that's great, but then if you lose the thumbprint, that person who owns the thumbprint, that person with those thumbs, is now unable to be authenticated anywhere else, or, you know, they're, they're a victim of ID theft, right? So is that something that people can generally get behind, is my question. I guess. Yes. Well, Ryan, I, I, just, wait, I don't wait, think, it, Andy, I really Andy, don't think. Andy, Andy, Andy yeah, sorry, sorry Mark, Mark was talking. It's just, I know it's hard to hear from him because he's so far away from the phone. Actually, I, I would just say yes, but I think it's in the law. And in terms of, I think maybe somebody, Andy, can riff on the, the how businesses use this. If I've got a database of all the information I collected at a business, and in that database, seven bits of PII, without biometric or required to be kept in a reasonably secure manner, even if at this point a pure negligence standard could apply, I think, in terms of I'm, I have your name, it got out there along with 50 million other ones. Actually, in this day and age, I mean, Vermont statute aside, I'll find a negligence argument to make, but I think we've already got a, as a practical matter, a statute that says you have to keep reasonable data security controls. Most businesses that are looking at that have 50 other state data privacy laws to look at. If they sell so much as anything overseas, they're already supposed to be GDPR compliant and everything else. So I don't object to any of it, I guess, to sort of say, let's make sure the right thing is included in there. I'm, I'm being a little facetious. I don't, I don't mean it's not important. I have to say, how is biometric information not PII already? Well, and, and again, and, and actually, I right. don't answer. That was a rhetorical question. I, 
I understand the different ways it didn't, but as a practical matter, um, I also don't think that one state out of 50, I'm, I'm the guy that says, I actually like how Europe did it for the past 25 years, and the fact that Congress is inept is making us having this discussion in ways that maybe it wouldn't be the national solution. So, so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying, what I, what I just heard there was I didn't hear anyone object to the notion of reasonable data security for biometrics. There was raised that, okay, well, the devil's in the details. Fine. Got it. Okay. But so that seems to be something that is generally agreeable. Okay. One of the biggest, um, yes. I just want to be clear. I don't know about everybody else sitting around the table. I didn't come here with authority to agree to anything. So fair enough. Yeah. You, didn't, you didn't hear any objection from me, but I, I want to. My silence isn't consent. We, we are not going to represent to anybody that everyone was on board with everything. <laughs> right. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so you know, one of the fundamental elements of uh, the BIPA law basically says that if you're going to collect biometric information, you need to get consent to do so. Now, understanding that, what does that mean, get consent to do so, that's, I have been told that that is a, a vague area in the current law and that has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, um, lawsuits. Um, so again, if the definition of biometrics could be agreed to and if that consent piece could be agreed to, if we could come to something that was you know, you know, a, a compromise or something that actually worked for industry, right? Uh, that was doable. Does anyone at, at a high level object to the notion of getting consent prior to collecting individuals' biometric information? What's the argument against it? Ryan, uh, uh, we're, <laughs> these are the conversations that need to be had thoughtfully and with lots of different uh, stakeholder Which is why we're here so today. I, I, none of us, oh, Ryan, none of us here are authorized to agree to anything uh, on behalf of our members. All of these concepts need to be vetted with our members. That's a fair request. Um, and so I don't think anybody here is going to be you know, saying, yep, great, here are seven concepts, go draft a bill by Friday. I, I don't think that's, a, that's, these are the kinds of questions and issues that are discussed uh, in a study group. I'll, I'll throw out a hypothetical out of the top of my brain, not share anything else. I actually agree with what was just said, so I'm not, you know, but uh, what I'm thinking about is, I actually went after I looked at the articles and then after I heard about the testimony and whatnot, uh, I jumped up jumped on the sex state site, looked at Clearview AI's data broker filing. Then I thought about all of this stuff is going to protect consumers. I thought about who's a consumer. I then jumped on the AI, Clearview AI website. And they already, they already scraped everybody by breach of contract simply by surfing the web. That's why Google, Facebook, everybody else is going after them. I don't know if they're concerned only about facial recognition or the fact that they took the pictures from their platforms without their permission, but they certainly aren't going, aren't. my picture is in Clearview AI's database. I'm not a user of theirs, I can't be. They say it's only law enforcement. I don't know who that is or what that is. I'm deathly afraid of that. Now, so I agree with Michael Lee's stuff. As he and I talked about the week before he went down, we were like, where are you, where are we? Oh, we're together, great. As it turned out, for scheduling reasons, we were going to testify on the second day of H95 when this came up. That's why the ETTA wasn't there. Um, but all of this happens, and if there's one actor that says, before anybody even knows I exist, I'm going to do X, call somebody else, my user, the consumer, I'm obligated to the person who pays me money to use the service and whatnot. And we've done a lot of legislating and stuff like that. And I don't even know it's going to attack the worst, most obvious, most talked about problem that caused us to all gather in the first place in this way. It's a tortured, twisted, illogical circle I just spewed for. I hope it made sense, but I, and so, 
Yes, I can agree in general, I believe in consent. Implied, active, what counts and what not. Clearview is not targeting me, they're not asking me anything, they're not marketing me, they're not doing anything, but they have my data. How do I not give consent to those types of folks? So I'm for consent, but without a full understanding of actually the business processes that go involved in each individual ones, which are always different from our high level similarities. It's sort of like, you know, we, we need public education, we need awareness. Uh, all the protections in the world don't stop me from not being able to keep up with my inbox. And, and so I am for protecting all of us philosophically. I'm for good process, good study good solutions for working together, um, except we're talking about something I don't even know about, can't talk to my members about, and even if we came up with something that was agreeable, the example that brought us all here today may or may not be taken care of, even if I nodded to everything we proposed. And so I'm, I'm acknowledging the problem, agreeing it is a problem, and simply saying, Let's be deliberate, let's go with pace, let's be proactive, let's be as deliberate as possible. And I think the Vermont way is we figure it out. And not everybody agrees, but if we can all say, I had my opportunity to study it, to chime in, and I simply lost a substantive debate, I go home, I'll fight again another day. I'm a process guy personally, so I know where I personally stand, substance aside. Um, I'm here until 3 o'clock or until Brian or Charity say, we're going to go and talk to TJ about this. And our inclination, what we're hearing is we think we might, of course, we can't confirm, but we might be recommending X. So that. I, I don't know. I, it's. It's, it's really helpful. Um, for those of you who haven't weighed in, I just want to make sure that we don't end this meeting without hearing from everyone who might have a comment or you want to echo what someone else said. So now, I think now's the time. Or if someone wants to introduce a new concept that we haven't touched on. So I think um, unless anyone has anything else they want to add, um, I want to say that you know Ryan and I are around. So if something comes up, or if you do speak to one of your clients and you you know another point comes up or something you want to communicate, um, we're we're here and uh, just give us a ring or drop us an email. Um, we will be there on Tuesday. We haven't obviously spoken to, to TJ since this meeting, but we will and um, we'll have something formed on Tuesday. Um, but between now and then, please reach out if you have something else to add or questions or anything. Ryan, do you have anything else? Yeah, only to, to reiterate that, um, that we are available. I've been giving out my cell phone number for anyone who wants to contact. Um, those productive conversations, you know, hearing the, the, case, the use cases are very valuable to us. Um, it has often been valuable to us to hear from actual business owners right uh, yep. you know um, who, who can give us you know this more direct notion so that would that is also always useful and I just uh, you know I do want to reiterate something that was told to me when I was sworn Plus in, in one, this office. 1767947043 is now exiting. I have something really nice to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that is I, as I was told by the, the former Attorney General that you know I swore an oath to protect, and we all swore an oath to protect the public. And the public is not just consumers. The public includes the business community. The public often includes the business that we are bringing enforcement action against, right? We are not, we are not win at all costs in this office. We are not zealous advocates. We think we take all of the different positions into account, and that is how we have always done things, and that is how we are all going to, always going to do things. So that is, that is our commitment, and that is the oath that I swore. 
Well oh. said, Brian. What a way to close the meeting. I mean, there's yeah, nothing yeah, yeah. That I can add to that. Somebody hang up ahead of that. <laughs> yeah, really, they missed something. So there wonderful. you go. Um, I wrote down the phone number. <laughs> Despite substantive decisions. Sounded like a re election speech to me. <laughs> All right, Ryan in 2020. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming and uh, being here. And thanks to those of you on the phone. Thank you, particularly for your patience while we started out the conference call dial in. And, um, I guess we'll either talk to you between now and Tuesday, or maybe we'll see you on Tuesday. Plus one six one seven four zero. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye, guys. Thank you. Unless that was Maggie. <laughs>